Ah, thank you, Lord. All right, you guys can have a seat. Um, man, wasn't the worship great? Just want to thank Frank and uh, the Maranatha t- band. Uh, they've done a great job for us. I met Frank uh, maybe four or five years ago, uh, and he was doing a project, and would you believe it, it was on worship, uh, and I had the privilege of being a part of that project with him, um, and so glad to see what God is doing in and through him. Well, good morning, church. Good morning, fathers. Happy Father's Day. It's our day, is it not? we weren't in a series, I would preach a, uh, a sermon called Don't Shortchange Us. <laughs> I'm just saying, this place was bustling on Mother's Day, so I want to hear all the sights and sounds and clapping and jumping <laughs> celebration today. Uh, if you're sitting with a good father, I hope that uh, you have plans for him today. Um, now, on Mother's Day, they, uh, they ordered some roses, and even though they didn't come on time, um, it was the thought that counts. So I'm just trying to see, brothers, what we're going to get today when we come out. Can we, can we, can we get like some burgers, you right, some steaks or something on the way out? Just hand it to a brother. <laughs> something. Um, but yeah, I just, I just hope that you have plans um, for uh, the fathers in your lives. Sisters, don't make him grill today. Um, if you have to do takeout, um, I would say you grill instead, but if you have, I don't have many rules in my house, but the one I do is nobody can touch my grill. <laughs> no one can touch my pit. So, um, well, you see I'm a hot mess on Father's Day at my house. But on a serious note, though, celebrate uh, the fathers in your life as much as you can. You know, it's funny, all year long we, we're, on, we're on, these, uh, on these men these fathers uh, telling them to how to lead their families and engage with their children and get on their knees and stay on their word uh, and watch their ears and watch their eyes. And, and uh, you know, every once in a while, we need to just uh, hear uh, how much you appreciate that. Um, so when you go home today or whoever you have plans with, your father, your husband, whoever it may be, your spiritual father, uh, just remember to affirm him, thank him, encourage him, bless him. Because uh, it can be hard on us dads sometimes. So show him how much it means uh, to you, how much he means to you today. Would you do that? All right, amen. All right, let's get into this word. Uh, like we did for Mother's Day, we're going to continue in our series, Let's Go. Um, but instead of breaking, we're going to, uh, it's going to take us into Mark chapter 2. And we're going to be re- reading verses 1 through 12. Uh, read it along with me in your Bibles or on your devices. Um, and then we will uh, get right into it, pray, and see what God has to say. It says, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered there that no room was left, not even outside the door. He preached the word to them. Some men came bringing a paralytic, and carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, uh, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, they lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Your sins are forgiven, which is easier to say. Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. 
God, as we come today uh, into your word, we begin to go through this passage. God, I pray, Father, that each and every one of us, Lord, would see something in there, in here for us. I pray, Father, that you would allow the word to fall on good ears. And God, I pray, Father, that you would use my words, Lord, which I believe came from you, and that they would touch somebody today, change a life, save a soul. Go before us today, Lord, and do what only divinity can do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In a movie called Invictus, uh, Morgan Freeman plays a South African president, and uh, Matt Damon plays a captain of a rugby team. There's a scene where uh, he comes in, uh, a guy named Jason comes into the room, and as he's coming into the room, Morgan Freeman says to him, you look agitated, Jason. And he says, yes, I am, he said, because he said, I just got this word uh, according to these papers you have signed, and it looks like we are adding four men into our team. And uh, he says, yes, ah, yes, yes, let me see that, okay. Yeah, we, uh, we're adding four men. He said, they're, they're good men. He said, they're servicemen. Um, and he said, I think that they would be a good fit. And Jason begins to tell him, but, but why do we need him to come here? And Morgan Freeman cuts him off and says, reconciliation starts here. And he looks at him and he says, reconciliation? He says, he says listen, he says, when I go out in public, he said, the people look at my bodyguards. He said, and my bodyguards need to represent everyone that I represent. And he said, so that's why we need them here. And uh, Jason says to him, but listen, these are the four men that that have recently tried to kill us. These are the four men that have put a tax on us. And in fact, they have succeeded some. Morgan Freeman says to him, and forgiveness starts here too. He says, Jason... Forgiveness starts here, too. He says, forgiveness removes fear. He says, that's why it's one of the most powerful weapons there is. So in the movie, we have four men who have come to help one man ensure that no one can get to the ultimate man, the president of South Africa. But in contrast, in our text today, we'll see another four men who have come to help one man so that he can get to the ultimate man, Jesus Christ. In our story today, there is forgiveness, there is healing, uh, and there are lessons that we can learn as we're seeing these men pushing to find another way. That's the title of our message today, In Pursuit of Another Way. Starting in verses 1 through 3, we find that Jesus once again is in Capernaum, and the people get word that he had come home. Now, it's believed that this is not his actual home, but if you remember earlier in chapter 1, he was at Peter's house, and while he was at Peter's house, uh, he had healed Peter's mother-in-law. And then they were bringing uh, many other people uh, to Uh, to heal for him. And so he was healing like crazy that day. Um, But then after a while, the disciples went to go look for him and they couldn't find him. And then they found him off praying and they said, hey, the the, the people are looking for you. Uh, And he says, let's go somewhere else. He said to some of the surrounding areas, he said, so that I can preach there also. He said, this is why I have come. So he wanted to leave because he was healing people and that was not what he was there for. People hearing the word preached was much more important to him. So when they say he came home, it's referring to Peter's house, where he typically would stay when he was ministering in that town. So the people heard that he had come. They gathered in the house. There are so many people in the house that they had to gather outside of the house as well. Um, And they were all around the house trying to hear Jesus preach. The Bible tells us that there was not even room outside the front door. So you have to picture this in your mind. If you grew up in my area, think house parties. Anybody grew up doing the house party days? Nobody wants to raise their, admit that. 
well, you, did, you, know, you didn't send out invitations. Many times you didn't even know half of the people that showed up there. It was just word of mouth. And as people heard about it, uh, they would come. And they all showed up for different reasons. For some, it was to a meeting place to go to the next, uh, the next event. For some, it was because there was nothing else to do. And this scene reminds me of that. Some came to be healed of a disease. Some came to hear the word. And others came to just observe. So here they are at, at Peter's healing party house. And uh, they, these four men walk up carrying a paralytic. Now remember the scene. The house is packed inside. There are people all around the front door, all around the outside. I can see them pushing their way through. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, ma'am. A little nudge, a little push. And you would think that when they walked up, that people would start to move to the side and let them by. However, as one author said, sometimes hearers get in the way of seekers. All they seemed to carry about was hearing Jesus for themselves not worried about letting others in who may need him or do not know him. And I'll try to get back to that a little later. So these four men were friends of the paralytic from what we know. Uh, and we can learn a few lessons from all five of them, the four friends and the paralytic, in their pursuit of Jesus. So here are a few lessons that I'd like to flesh out in our time together. The first one is, is uh, there was a deep concern for others when we look at these men. There was a deep concern for others. Their friends could not walk to Jesus. Their friend could not crawl to Jesus. He could not call on him because it, it, with a crowd like that, he wouldn't be able to hear them. So they carried him. When we think about our series, Let's Go, this speaks volumes to that theme. Having a deep concern for people having a deep concern for our friends, for our loved ones, for the lost, is part of the mission that many of us are on. Their concern was so deep that they spent a significant amount of time helping this man get what he needed. You know, sometimes we don't know what we need, but it's great to have people around us who are concerned enough, who love us enough to get us in the right direction. Secondly, they worked together and all did their part to carry out the mission. These guys carried this man to Peter's house. I imagine that this, if this was post-quarantine, it was really heavy to carry him. It took four of them, so you know that this was a challenge, right? I mean, we know today that men very rarely come to Jesus on their own. Typically, it takes several people, several someones, influencing, to trust, influencing them to trust Christ and to follow him. We know as fathers, we can plant a seed that with our kids, our other men and family members, but many times, there'll be others besides ourselves who come along and water it. We see that in 1 Corinthians. Uh, but they worked together. They could not get to the crowd with him, so they started talking about what they could do. Now, I have a vivid imagination, so I can imagine what that conversation was like. I can imagine going, it going something like this. Well, Willie, what do you think? I don't know, Billy. I reckon this mat is about six by six, and we should be able to fit it up yonder. Roscoe, can you and uh, Clyde sort of clear the way to the stairs so we can get this boy in here before Jesus disappears on us again? You know, I, I just imagine my, my, uh, my family and I, especially my, my daughter and I, are just really into to different accents. She's into the British. I don't know where she got that from, but she's really into British accents. Um, and so uh, we do that uh, quite a bit to, to mimic them. But, but no person, they work together. They were passionate about the mission uh, before them. No one person had to do all the work, but instead everyone had a task to do. The church today can learn from that. Next, uh, there was a determination to find another way, to find another way. So what did they end up doing? Verse 4 reads that they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, they lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. Now, when the four men came up to the scene after that, 
listen, they've come so far with him in tow, right? They could not get through the crowd. They could have said, oh, well, we, we tried. We, we put in a decent, a decent effort. Uh, we're tired. This dude is heavy. Um, you know, we made a good effort. They could have left the man there and walked away saying, hey, we, we did all that we could do. The paralyzed man could have said, hey, thanks, boys. Appreciate it. Um, he'll be back again, I'm sure. Uh, eventually, I'll get to Jesus. No, they saw the opportunity, and they understood that the time was now. They did not want to lose that moment because they knew that Jesus was their only hope and that timing was everything. Chances are they may not get that moment back. So they took him up to the roof. Now, that's no easy task at all, um, carrying a person, first of all. You imagine some of you have a, a toddler. You just get tired just carrying the toddler. Imagine carrying a grown person together, walking with them. So they take him up to the roof, and they start tearing a portion off the roof. Now, this may seem unrealistic to many of us because uh, we're, we're used to sort of the modern-day roofs where they seal them down, and it would take tools uh, to take a portion of the roof off. Now, if you've ever watched a, rip being t uh, a roof being torn off, it takes about four hours or more to do that kind of job. And they did it within minutes. However, the roofs in first century Palestine were such that the structures were flat, right? And they were covered with a lot of mud and a lot of branches, and they were sort of all intertwined in there. So if you can imagine that as they're digging, they're just sort of digging through mud and digging through grass and digging through twigs and, and different things like that. And they literally dug up hardened mud to get to Jesus. They were determined to find another way into the house. So what does that look like for us? What does that look like for us today? What would it be like, fathers, if we not only prayed for our families and led our families, but if by any means necessary we sought after Jesus for our families, that in prayer indeed we did not give up when things got really hard? You do know that it's possible to give up without ever saying it, right? It shows in your actions. These men were resilient. What would it look like if we stopped saying we tried, we did our best, hey, I'm doing a lot, leave me alone. What if we instead say, oh, that's not working? Okay, let me, let me try this. Okay, that's not working, all right, let me try something else. Okay, that's not working? Let me, try, let, me, let me try this. Let me try this. I hit this wall. That's okay. I'm going to keep going. I ran into this barrier. Okay. I hit this disappointment. All right. I don't feel appreciated. Okay. Giving me everything and no one is reciprocating. I don't feel this. I don't feel that. But what if it's like if we just fought through all of that? That's what this is like in the physical there. That's what it's like for us in the spiritual to, to fight for everything to get to Jesus. We want to refuse to stop going after Jesus for answers, for forgiveness, for healing, for peace, for contentment. What would it be like in your life if you pursued Jesus like that daily? Lord, I'm still following hard after you. I'm exhausted. There's dirt and mud and, and grease underneath my nails. I virtually had no sleep. My job is draining me. Kids are dancing on my nerves. Yet I'm still fighting. I'm still in hot pursuit of our Lord and Savior. What would it be like? Next, there was an unspoken faith. There was an unspoken faith. In verse 5, it reads that after they lowered the mat, Jesus said something to them. Now, before we read that, let me just point out that preachers don't like to be interrupted. Right? We hear cell phones, we hear people whispering who think that they're whispering, but we can actually hear them. We hear beautiful babies crying, um, and, and, it may, and it interrupts us sometimes. Uh, I remember when uh, my, uh, our oldest daughter was um, a baby, um, we would bring in the car seat, and we would have her in the car seat, and that we just never took her out of that. We came from the car, put her on the chair um, right next to us, either facing me or facing her mom. And uh, she was so quiet, and she would just watch his worship, and she would just throw her hands up, and she would be clapping and all of that, but she was so quiet, never said a word, until the preacher started preaching. 
And all of a sudden, she had a lot to say. And it was really weird because she would be talking while he's talking, and when he paused, it was like she paused. And she was just preaching along with him. So my wife and I would always reminisce uh, about those moments. But they don't like to be interrupted. But what we find here, Jesus is seeing that the mat is being lowered. He's interrupted by these men. And remember, most likely, pieces of mud and pieces of branches and things are falling somewhere around them. Yet, this is how he responds. Read it with me. When Jesus saw their faith, He's talking about all five of them, not just the paralytic. He said, son, your sins are forgiven. I can see the paralytic's face. It's like when my wife puts a veggie burger on my plate instead of an all-beef patty. It's like, that's not what I asked for. And so, and that's him there, right? He, he's, he's looking there and he says, he said, that's not what I asked for. You see these legs? They can't move. I can't move my legs. Man, let me ask you a question. What do you do when God sets aside what you want to give you what you need? What do you do when God sets aside what you want to give you what you need? He tells the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven. Now, up until this point, up until this point rather, uh, these five men... None of them has said anything to Jesus. You notice that in the story? It wasn't their words. It wasn't their persuasion. It wasn't their pleas to God about this that, ex- that made Jesus exercise his authority to forgive sins. It was their faith, dads. I know as men we're doers. I know we like to think of we can do it. We can solve it. We can address it. We can talk it out. We can work it out. We can, we can do it. But he saw their faith. He sees the paralyzed man's ultimate need, and he sees mine and your ultimate need. It's not financial. It's not physical. It's not even so much relational. It's that your sin grieves him because he is a holy God, and although he could do all those things for you, and he may, that's just not his primary concern. It's something that's eternal, not temporary. Healing would be temporary, right? Because a person would eventually die. The forgiveness of sins, that's eternal. If you're here today and you're streaming and you don't know Jesus Christ, he's waiting to forgive you of your sins and offer you something that you can't get anywhere else. Today is the day. Do not harden your hearts, the Bible tells us. Give your life to him. Your way hasn't been working, but I'm here to tell you today that there's another way. Teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? Why is he blaspheming? He's speaking with contempt about God. Who can forgive sin but God alone? The scribes now see Jesus' authority on display, but would not believe it because it did not fit their concept of God. It did not fit their concept of forgiveness. And we're all guilty of that in some ways. We have our little ways of thinking about things. And if it doesn't fit, we buck and we pull and we grumble, we push. But as we look at the scribes, the real paralysis for them is not in the body like the paralyzed man. It may be physical for some here today. It can be spiritual as well. However, the real paralysis of the scribes, I believe, lies in their hearts and in their minds. How is your heart this morning? Are you feeling paralyzed because you don't expect to have any, you didn't expect to have any, you know, as many barriers as you do, as many hindrances in your life, in your pursuit of him? To get to his plan for you, your healing, your acceptance of his forgiveness of sins, I'm here to tell you, fathers, you're going to make it. You're going to make it. Just keep looking, keep searching, believe and have faith that your tomorrow will not be like your yesterday. He's okay with you interrupting him because he has your healing. He has your strength. He has your answer, and you're, you are forgiven, so keep pursuing him. You're already forgiven. 
So the scribes were thinking this in their hearts, and Jesus, discerning in his spirit, knowing what was in their hearts, replies to him in the latter part of verse 8 and 9. He says, what are you thinking? Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man? Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? Now, this question is, re is important. Remember, uh, remember, saying here is actually doing. Saying is doing. To do one thing is to do the other in this situation. So to heal was to forgive. If Jesus says your sins are forgiven, well, they can say what they want, but you can't really verify that, right? The only, only the consciousness of the sinner could verify the power of those words. So it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. Now to say pick up your mat and walk, well, that verifies that, verifies that both healing and forgiveness in Jesus' authority and, and everyone around there can see very quickly if that was going to happen or not. So he says in verse 10, so that you may know, you guys recognize that language? Remember when Lazarus was raised from the dead and uh, he said, Father, I know that you hear me. I know that you always hear me. But for those standing here, Lazarus come forth. He says, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. As I said, the scribes have not said a word. Remember, Jesus is in the spirit discerning what they were thinking. So the four friends have not said a word. The paralytic has not said a word. Nobody has spoken except for Jesus. Pay a close, close attention to that fact. And now he tells a paralyzed man on a mat to stand up and walk home. The man moves. He rises from his mat. Remember, this is not the movies. So when Jesus, this is Jesus who has healed him. So it's not the movies. He's not getting up like some of you fathers do in the morning. Uh, very slowly, one leg at a time, scooting to the edge of the bed, preparing that body to get up. Uh, he, he jumps up, makes his way through the crowd. And of course, now they want to move as they watch in amazement as he walks by. I can see his friends outside the door greeting him. He no longer needed their help in carrying the mat. Where before he had been skeptic and he had been unbelieving, now there was a sense of amazement and a sense of awe. The people stood there saying, we have never seen anything like this before. That's my prayer for you and for I today. That we would be able to say often throughout our journey of pursuing Jesus and going, breaking through barriers and hindrances that we have never seen anything like this before. Not just once. My prayer is that we'd be able to say it often, that he is working so sweetly in our lives that we would be able to see it often. That you at different times in your life can proclaim, proclaim over and over and over again, I've never seen anything like this. Do you want that? You want that for your life? Just two people want that for their lives? You want that for your life? You want that for your fathers, for your husband? Stand with me. Let's bow your heads. Let's pray. God, as we close our time together, Lord, as we think about this message, Lord, about these verses, Lord, I pray for each and every person in this room, starting with the children, up to the young adults and adults. God, I pray, Father, that as we go through life, 
that we would be in pursuit of another way, that we would not let any barrier, that we not let anything that comes up against us, whether it be disappointment or whether it be a snag or whether we didn't get what we want, Lord, because you know that what we need, you know exactly what we need, and sometimes it's not what we want. I pray, Father, for that person today, Lord, who is, uh, who is struggling of the challenges of their life. Lord, we pray, Father, that they would be renewed. Lord, we pray for a renewed strength. Lord, we pray, Father, for that they would remember that they have been forgiven of their sins, Lord. And that spiritually and emotionally and physically, you got them. You got them. They're going to make it. I pray for other of, other of us, Lord, who are, who are going through, Lord, but, but have already been there and, and will see it again, Lord. We're, we're not going to stop seeing that in our lives, Lord. We're not going to start seeing the, the things that would come against us, Lord. But I pray, Father, that we would just continue to move forward fighting pushing, nudging through the crowd to get to you. You're our only hope, and we thank you for it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. So as we, as we leave today, just want to say um, happy Father's Day to all of you again. Again, I hope that you guys have a great day, whatever you have planned, whether that's just Netflix and chill or if that's out at the park or whatever you're going to do. Uh, I'm trying to go for a bike ride, but I heard it's going to be really hot, so I might renege on that. Um, but whatever you do, I pray that you guys uh, enjoy it and enjoy your day as you go forth. Let's pray. Now to him who is able to keep us from falling and present us uh, before him. To the only wise God, be majesty forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.